Tonight, we will have the opportunity to hear from both Dr. Robert Price and Dr. Gregory Boyd. Dr. Robert Price will be taking the negative, the negative position, arguing that the historical Jesus is not the Jesus of the Christian faith in what I'll call the traditional sense, meaning the Jew of the Messiahs, the, sec, the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity. Dr. Gregory Boyd will be taking the affirmative position, arguing that the historical Jesus is indeed the Jesus of the Christian faith. Dr. Price has two PhDs from Drew University. One is in systematic theology, the other is in New Testament. He is editor for the Journal of Higher Criticism, the director for the Center of Inquiry in New York and New Jersey, and an active member in the Jesus Seminar. Dr. Gregory Boyd, he received his Master's of Divinity from Yale, Yale Divinity School. He received his PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. He was a theology professor at Bethel College for 16 years. He's also the founder of Christus Victor Ministries, as well as a senior pastor of Woodland Hills Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. We are very fortunate to have both of these great minds with us tonight. They both speak, write, and publicly debate. In fact, tonight is going to be their fourth debate with each other. We like each other. Yeah. Please welcome Dr. Price. You know, uh, if Larry King really did interview him, you know, the question he'd really ask is, what was it like working with Simon Peter? Uh, that's, uh, that's not exactly my favorite. Anyway, uh, one, one little uh, correction. I uh, uh, abdicated my illustrious position as uh, director of the New York Center of the Center for Inquiry uh, a while ago. I, I still consider myself a humanist, like my pal Jim Underdown back there, but I also, uh, in a kind of paradoxical mode, am a church-going Episcopalian. I just am no longer uh, orthodox or evangelical in faith, though I used to be. I was uh, for a while... A president of a student uh, chapter of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, uh, went to Campus Crusade and got training in the four spiritual laws and later wrote a satire of it called, Have You Heard of the Five Calvinist Laws? Uh, at the end of which you, you find out that you're one of the uh, predetermined reprobate to be damned and you sign a little certificate say, I accept eternal hell is my lot. And later on. Anyway, uh, but... Um, uh, I, uh, I, I have, uh, what I want to tell you tonight is, is not exactly kind of a negative assessment of who I think Jesus was or was not, but the reasons for the virtual agnosticism that I hold about the question, uh, to me the Christ of faith and the Jesus of history are different things, both fascinating in very different ways though, and uh, if you can look at um, the way I view uh, the menu of the options for the historical Jesus, if you can wade through my book Deconstructing Jesus that's uh, available at Amazon or whatever. Got another one coming out uh, at the end of this year from uh, Prometheus Books also called The Incredible Shrinking Son of Man which tries to show how we know less and less and less than scholars used to think. Well, evangelical apologists repudiate the notion that the Gospels contain legendary or fictitious material about Jesus Christ. They want to be able to believe he did and said everything attributed to him in the Gospels. They always use the same arguments, including the importance of the short time span between Jesus and the writing of the Gospels and the centrality of eyewitnesses in the formation of the Gospel tradition. Such factors are said to make it unlikely, if not impossible, for the Gospels to contain fabricated or legendary material. For instance, Josh McDowell says or whoever got to write this paragraph, somebody in the book said, uh, one of the major criticisms against the form critic's idea of the oral tradition is that the period of oral tradition as defined by the critics is not long enough to have allowed the alterations in the tradition that the radical critics have alleged. And the quote, similarly, John Warwick Montgomery asserts, Quote, with the small time interval between Jesus' life and the gospel records, the church did not create a Christ of faith. And quote, this small time interval, even according to the most conservative estimate of gospel dating, would have to be about 30 or 40 years. Apologists protest that this is not really a long period at all. As McNeil says, 
quote, it is not usual, I'm sorry, it is not unusual for men even of slight intellectual ability to recall and relate clearly important events occurring 35 years previously. But surely that's not the point. Critics suggest not so much that eyewitnesses forgot the details of what they saw. I forget, Peter. Did Jesus walk on water or was he water skiing? No. Uh, no, the question is whether other people saw uh, very little to nothing about Jesus and then spun out legendary material during those years, as, as uh, D.F. Strauss suggested. People uh, who had little to remember and tried to just fill in the gaps of their knowledge. But if the, if the apologists are right, records of similar religious figures written within a comparable time span should also be free of legendary embellishment. Well, are they? What do we find? This is what really began to crack my confidence in the apologetical edifice. Uh, Gershom Scholem's study of the 17th century messianic pretender, Sabbatai Svi, provides a good parallel here. Sabbatai Svi was able to arouse apocalyptic fervor among Jews all over the Mediterranean during the 1660s. The movement suffered a serious setback when the Messiah renounced Judaism under the gun and turned to Islam. You thought a crucified Christ was a bitter pill to swallow. But uh, the movement did not die away after that. The history of Sabbatai Tzvi is, is important because it's readily accessible to us, more so than that of Jesus, because obviously this Messiah lived a lot closer to our own era, and much more documentary evidence survives him. Well, here too, according to the apologists, legends should have waited at least a couple of generations till they reared their ugly heads. But Sholem speaks of, quote, the sudden and almost explosive surge of miracle stories, unquote, concerning Sabbatai Sevi within weeks or even days of his public appearances. Listen to this description by Sholem. The realm of imaginative legend soon dominated the mental climate in Palestine while Sabbatai Sevi was there. The, the sway of imagination was strongly in evidence in letters sent to Egypt and elsewhere, and which, by the autumn of 1665, the same year, had assumed the character of regular messianic propaganda in which fiction far outweighed the facts. For instance, the prophet was encompassed with a fiery cloud, and the voice of an angel was heard from the cloud. End of quote. Letters from December of the same year related that Sabbatai Tzvi commanded a fire to be made in a public place in the presence of many beholders, and entered into the fire twice or thrice without any hurt to his garments or to a hair on his head. End of quote. Other letters tell of his raising the dead. He is said to have left his prison through locked and barred doors, which opened by themselves after his chains miraculously broke. He kills a group of highwaymen merely with the word of his mouth. Interestingly, the miracle stories often conform to the patterns of contemporary saints' legends, just as Strauss theorized that the gospel miracle stories are often based on Old Testament tales of Moses, Elijah, and Elisha. Literary prototypes were ready to hand, so it needn't have taken long at all for legends to pop up. Same thing happened earlier to Yehuda, the Hasid, who died in 1217. In his own lifetime, legends made him a great magician, though in fact Yehuda was a staunch opponent of magic. Skipping ahead, 20th century African prophet and martyr Simon Kimbangu, uh, who, who started the largest denomination in, in the Congo even today, he became another living legend despite his own wishes. One group of his followers spread his fame as the God of the Blacks or Christ of the Blacks, even while Kimbangu himself, languishing in prison, disavowed the role. Legends of his childhood, his miracles, and his prophetic visions began within his own generation. 1950s faith healer William Marion Branham was held in high esteem by legions of his followers, many of whom believed him to be Jesus Christ returned, or even a new incarnation of God. He, however, didn't teach such notions. In fact, once on a visit to such a group of devotees in Latin America, he explicitly denied any such wild claims. But his followers reasoned that he must have just been testing their faith. Well, 
Ed Sanders encountered a number of legends about Charles Manson while researching his fascinating book, The Family. On one particular bus trip in Death Valley, quote, several miracles were alleged to have been performed by Charles Manson. Uh, one story relates that, quote, Charlie levitated the bus over a creek crag, end quote. So it seems that an interval of 30 or 40 years could indeed accommodate the intrusion of legendary materials into the gospel tradition if the, you know, if the goose spits the, the, what is it, the sauce is good for the goose and for the gander, same thing here. Well, apologists, however, don't only argue from dates and time intervals. They also appeal to the role of eyewitnesses in the gospel tradition. Montgomery, like McDowell and others, employs what he calls the external evidence test. He says, quote, as to the authors and primary historical value of the gospel accounts, confirmation comes from independent written sources, unquote. Well, who are they? He goes on to quote, second century bishops Papias and Irenaeus, one from Hierapolis in Asia Minor, the other one from Lyon in Gaul, to the effect that the Gospels of Matthew and John were written by the disciples of those names and that Mark was written from the preaching of Peter. But there's no real reason to think so. These guys were at least 100 and 150 years after the uh, texts themselves. If the author of the so-called Gospel of Matthew had been an original disciple, why would he have merely expanded Mark for his Gospel, which itself was not written by an eyewitness? Why would he not have used his own recollections of Jesus? In fact, we can't even be sure Papias is even referring to what we call Matthew and Mark. What he says about uh, the Gospel, uh, the, the traditionally taken to be Matthew, would fit better the Gospel according to the Hebrews, an apocryphal text. What he says about Mark recording the preaching of Peter would fit the Kerygmata Petru better than the Gospel of Mark, so we don't really know whether they were talking about our books or not. But some apologists will accept a looser connection between the Gospels and eyewitnesses. Uh, the eyewitnesses wouldn't have to be the authors. The Gospels, they say, are the result of a process of oral tradition, word-of-mouth transition. Some, like F.F. F. Bruce, actually seem to think that's what happened. Others, like Montgomery, only seem to accept the idea for the sake of argument. But in either case, the objectives to show that the formation of any such oral or community tradition about Jesus was firmly under the control of eyewitnesses all the way, and thus wouldn't have admitted of legendary embellishment. And so F.F. F. Bruce writes, and of course I'm tempted to read this with a British accent, but I won't, uh, quote, it can have been by no means so easy as some writers seem to think to invent words and deeds of Jesus in those early years when so many of his disciples were about who could remember what had and had not happened, end of quote. The idea is that the apostles and other eyewitnesses would have seen to it that rank and file believers didn't let their fancy run wild in creating stories and sayings of Jesus. Well, it seems to me that this argument rests on an anachronistic picture of the apostles' activity. They're imagined here as a kind of team of fact-checkers ranging over Palestine, sniffing out legends and clamping the lid on any they discover. If the apostles declined to leave their preaching to wait on tables, I kind of doubt they had time for this sort of thing either. Again, look at Sabbatai Sevi. We know that the chief apostle of his movement, Nathan of Gaza, repeatedly warned the faithful beforehand that the Messiah would do no miracles. But as we've seen, miracle stories gushed forth without abatement. Keep in mind the caution of Roman Catholic scholar Hippolyte Delahaye, who worked on the uh, saints' legends. In discussing the sources and the likely historical accuracy of these stories, he says, quote, The intellectual capacity of the multitude reveals itself on all sides as exceedingly limited, and it would be a mistake to assume that it usually submits itself to the influence of superior minds. On the contrary, the latter necessarily suffer loss from contact with the former, and it would be quite illogical to attribute a special value to a popular tradition because it had its origin amid surroundings in which persons of solid merit were to be met with. Ask any teacher or speaker how uh, he or she feels about the reception given the, uh, the, what he or she has said, uh, what, what they were thought to have meant, etc. Bruce and Montgomery go on to add a negative version of the eyewitness argument. 
What about hostile eyewitnesses who could have called the Christians bluff? Uh, uh, Bruce says, had there been any tendency to depart from the facts in any material respect, the possible presence of hostile eyewitnesses in the audience would have served as a further corrective, end of quote. Bruce is just not reckoning with the contagious fervor of apocalyptic movements. One hears what one wants to hear. In the case of Sabbatai V, we know that hostile witnesses did try to keep things under control, but to no avail. The rabbis of Constantinople announced that during the Messiah's stay there, quote, we have not beheld a single miracle or sign, only the noise of rumors and testimonies at second hand. But do you think anybody listened? In our own day, we can find several parallel cases, none of which seem to accord with the apologist's claims about what would or would not have happened. You might recall the brief flurry of interest during the great cult hysteria of the 70s and 80s over the young Guru Maharaj Ji. He was a rotund little Buddha of a man, a boy really, who had a notorious preference for Baskin Robbins ice cream. Uh, as it happened, he also had a preference for his American secretary and married her, much against the old world wishes of his mother. She promptly booted the young godling off the throne of the universe and replaced him with his drab older brother, of whom no one has heard anything since. Uh, what one might ask was the reaction of the membership to this train of events. Well, on a visit to Berkeley a year or so later, I saw his followers still handing out literature featuring the boy God's grinning it visage. I asked how this could still be possible and was told, well, they just refused to believe the whole thing happened. It all was the same as far as they were concerned. Or take the Rastafarians of Jamaica. They venerated the Ethiopian emperor Haile Selassie as God incarnate despite his own puzzled reaction. What became of their faith when the deposed emperor died? On a 60 Minutes broadcast, an intelligent-looking Jamaican journalist, himself a Rastafarian, said he believed Haile Selassie was still alive. His supposed death, a hoax fostered by the unbelieving Western media. In all such cases, we have to ask if cognitive dissonance reduction may be involved. When one has so much at stake in a belief being true, for example, Mark 10:28, lo, we have left everything to follow you. One simply cannot, psychologically speaking, to admit one might have been mistaken. Any fact may be denied or rationalized. Finally, one is impervious to the carping of hostile witnesses. In just the same way, uh, some of you are probably determined to reject my position beforehand, no matter what I may say. Just, you know, I, I don't know of anybody in particular, but ask yourself. Well, the eyewitness argument is dubious in yet another respect. Evidence shows that the proximity of eyewitnesses to the events does not even guarantee the factuality of their own reports. Turning again, well, skip a sabotage of move uh, quote, I got, I got millions of those. I'm going to William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist, a novel movie, take your pick. It was supposed to be based on an actual case. Henry Ansgar Kelly, a Roman Catholic priest, interviewed the priest who had conducted the rite. He freely confessed that all the supernatural effects had been added by rumor mongers and script writers. More important for our purposes, the exorcist himself, obviously no Bultmannian skeptic, just look at his job, uh, admitted that, quote, he recognized a strong myth-making tendency even in himself. If he did not record the events of each session of exorcism as soon as possible after it occurred, he declared he found the details changing in his mind, becoming more impressive, end of quote. Studies in forensic psychology have shown that eyewitness testimony is often remarkably unreliable, most especially when it's the testimony of a surprising and remarkable event. The witness will have to reach for some familiar analogy or category in order to be able to comprehend the oddity of all. Psychologists have staged unusual events and then immediately interviewed the observers with wildly disparate results. What did you see? And it may take only a half an hour for recollections to begin to blur and metamorphose. After a series of experiments, Hall, McFeeters, and Loftus report that, quote, whatever the source, additional information is acquired and is often readily integrated with original memory for the event. 
Thus, both pre- and or post-event information has in fact altered the content of what is recalled. Once created, the new memory can be as real and as vivid to the person as a memory acquired as the result of genuine perception. End of quote. For pre-event information here, read prior messianic expectations. For post-event information, read the early Christian preaching. In other words, memory altered in the light of the suggestions of faith. I repeat, there's no particular reason to think the Gospels are based on eyewitness testimony, but what if they were? Far from supporting the apologist's position, the dynamics of eyewitness testimony would seem to point in the opposite direction. The witnesses of Jesus saw a remarkable man with unusual gifts and proceeded to interpret him in categories drawn from Old Testament miracle tales and Jewish apocalyptic mythology. Once the gospel of a miracle-working Savior began to be preached, it's no surprise if the eager memories of eyewitnesses would begin to reflect that faith. Let's just turn briefly to the sayings of Jesus. Wouldn't special care have been taken to preserve Jesus' authentic sayings and to exclude bogus ones? Form critics suggest that sayings were created by the early Christians by the inspiration of the Spirit and then ascribed to Jesus. The idea is that it mattered little to them whether the saying came from the earthly Jesus or the exalted Christ. Well, conservatives reject this. F.F. Bruce is typical. It says, indeed, the evidence is that the early Christians were careful to distinguish between sayings of Jesus and their own inferences or judgments. Paul, for example, when discussing the vexed question of marriage and divorce in 1 Corinthians 7, is careful to make this distinction between his own advice on the subject and the Lord's decisive ruling. I, not the Lord, and again, not I, but the Lord, end of quote. But surely one text and the same one is invariably quoted isn't enough to settle the issue. Elsewhere, Bruce himself recognizes the very ambigu ambiguity stressed by the critics. Citing 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 18, Bruce says, We cannot be sure whether Paul is quoting a word of Christ which had come down to him in the tradition, or one that was communicated by the risen Lord through a prophet. Thought so. Well, by ancient Middle Eastern standards, it's not at all certain that faithful ministers of the word would never dare let a phony saying slip in. This might be the very thing they ought to do. Consider the analogy with the ministers of the Hadith, or the oral traditions of the Prophet Muhammad. How did they work? R.D. Smith describes it this way. Regarding the character of the transmitters of the traditions, especially during that vulnerable century when they were transmitted only by word of mouth and memory, two ancient Muslim authorities agree that, quote, a holy man is nowhere more inclined to lie than in the matter of traditions, unquote. There are many venerated Muslims who actually are known to have succumbed to this temptation, Smith says, some of them explicitly admitting that they did so. It is important to note, moreover, that in spite of the fact that these men were known as forgers, they were nonetheless revered as holy men because their lies were considered to be completely unobjectionable. It was a quasi-universal conviction that it was licit in the interest of encouraging virtue and submission to the law to concoct and put into circulation sayings of the prophets. Or how about uh, anthropologist Jan Van Sina in his book Oral Tradition as History? He says, quote, Historical truth is also a notion that is culture-specific. When G. Gosen reports that the Chamuleros, Maya Chiapas, believe that any coherent account about an event which has been retold several times is true, the historian does not feel satisfied. In many cultures, truth is what is being faithfully repeated as to content and has been certified as true by the ancestors. But sometimes truth does not include the notion that X and Y really happened. One cannot just assume that truth means faithful transmission of the content of a message. The historian must be on his guard. He cannot assume anything on this score, but must elucidate it for the culture he studies. End of quote. So much for the arguments used vainly by apologists to try to choke off gospel criticism at its source. Really, they're all attempts to get evangelical students and seminarians to pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Because if they do, things will get complicated. It will no longer be so easy to claim one is parroting the teaching of Jesus. No longer so easy to claim a personal relationship with a figure of history whose outlines are irreparably blurred in the mists of antiquity.
The task of the apologist is a quixotic quest. The locomotive of New Testament research will not stop for such a suicidal cow astride the tracks. I invite you instead to hop on board at the next stop. And then you can join in the exciting task of sifting the gospel traditions, recognizing the innumerable gospel contradictions and anachronisms no longer as troublesome flies in the dogmatic ointment, but rather as valuable clues and levers for unlocking the precious treasures of the text. Thank you. appreciate being invited to engage in this dialogue. Uh, as was noted, Bob and I have done this several times before, and I've always appreciated the, the exchanges. Uh, we both agree, there's not a lot of people who do this anymore, and we both agree it's fun and informative and important, and uh, so it's always a pleasure to be involved in this. And I, I, I really think that in terms of those who uh, debate and argue for the legendary hypothesis, uh, he does it about as good as it can be done. In my estimation, not good enough, though. And so I'll be presenting the alternative to that. Uh, the title of this uh, debate has been, uh, was, I was told, Jesus, Legend, Teacher, Critic, Son of God. And my thesis that I would, I'm going to argue for is that he was, in fact, teacher, he was prophet, he was critic, he was Son of God, but he was not legend. Uh, and the basis of that will be basically this. I don't think that the legendary hypothesis is adequate to explain what needs to be explained. I think Bob does an outstanding job of showing how people can, in certain situations, be incredibly gullible. I'm not convinced that he's shown that the New Testament authors are in that class. But there's also a positive grounds that I'll make, and that is that I think we've got very good reasons for believing that the Gospels are generally reliable. And that's the case I want to make. The question I'm going to kind of be circling around here then is this. Why think that gospel's accounts are, gospel accounts are not legendary? They include supernatural miracles. And one might argue that wherever there's supernatural miracles, we can assume it's legendary. But I want to argue that the gospels, in spite of the fact that they contain miracles, are not legendary. And I'm going to try to get through 12 points, 12 arguments for why I don't regard them as being legendary. Number one. Legendary parallels don't prove legend. Legendary parallels don't prove legend. Joseph Campbell, in his book, uh, A Hero with a Thousand Faces, uh, draws up a number of characteristics that almost all hero legends and hero myths have in common. The, the hero saves a maiden, comes close to death, a number of times overcomes his own insecurities, overcomes insurmountable odds, and things of that sort. Now, a lot of you saw the movie Braveheart, the story about William, Wa William Wallace, the man who uh, almost single-handedly freed Scotland from the, the rule of the British. The interesting thing is that he fits most of those, in fact, almost all of those characteristics. Now, as I understand Bob's logic, uh, it's, if, if something fits the category of legend, it must be legend. But here's William Wallace, who certainly fits all the features of legend, but... No historian argues that he's legendary. And the reason is because, as a matter of fact, um, there's good historical evidence that he did what he did, as incredible as it was. It shows the point that sometimes reality incarnates myth. C.S. Lewis and I would argue the same thing for the historical Jesus. Yes, there's a lot of legends that uh, in some ways approximate this. But we've got good reasons to believe that this is the real McCoy. The legend points towards, anticipates the reality. The longing for a hero issues forth legends that uh, anticipate the real hero. The longings for God and the intuitions about what reality is like uh, are then, in the same way, fulfilled in the person of, of, of Jesus Christ. That's why C.S. Lewis argues this, that Jesus is myth become reality. The legends... Anticipate him. Secondly, I would argue, I'm not going to just going to touch on it here, that the parallels, I may do this a little more later on, 
There are really no clear legendary parallels to the story of Christ. There are some similarities, and they certainly have supernatural elements in common, but on a number of grounds, I would argue that the similarities are, uh, the, the dissimilarities are very significant and have to be attended to. Point number three. They claim, the gospel authors claim to write history and aren't obviously non-historical. Standard historical methodology places the burden of proof on historians to show such writings to be unreliable. The burden of proof is not in the writings to prove that they are reliable. If we didn't make this assumption in standard historical methodology, our history books would be a whole lot smaller because more often than not, we have to rely on single or, or, or two testimonies that can't be corroborated. But the assumption is that if someone purports to be t uh, writing history, that we will, all other things being equal, take them at face value. Now, of course, in the case of obvious legends and, and, and mythology, uh, the genre itself puts the, the, the burden on the, the text to show where it is reliable. And so you have to sift through that. But the interesting thing about the Gospels is that while they include supernatural elements, they are in all other respects, uh, they don't fit the genre of legend. Again, C.S. Lewis said that I, he said, I spent my life studying le legends. He was a professor of mythology at Oxford. And he says, if there's one thing the Gospels aren't, it's legends. In all the other respects, there's sobriety and a number of other features. They give the appearance of being historical documents. They claim to be eyewitnesses. And that has to be taken into consideration. True, eyewitnesses sometimes can get it wrong. So they can be prone to legend. But the burden is on the historian to show that rather than on the text to show that they're not being legendary. So it says, for example, in, in 1 John chapter 1, here's what the, the apostle says. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have t looked at, touched with our hands. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also may have fellowship with us. This is a message that we, he's speaking on behalf of himself and the other apostles, we have heard from him and proclaim to you. He's, he's leveraging all of his credibility on the fact that he saw this, he heard this, he touched this, he was you know, around this, so were the other apostles. And he leverages everything on that. And, and uh, all theories apart, it comes down to this. Do you believe he was telling the truth or was he lying? It's, it's really that simple. He's, he's not telling the truth or he's telling the truth. Luke has a similar uh, preface to his gospel. He says, since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us. This isn't a long, long ago and far, far away kind of a deal. They were fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. He's not claiming to be an eyewitness, but he's saying he was handed on to him by eyewitnesses. I too decided after investigating everything carefully from the first. So he's a careful historian. Uh, I, I decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth. That's what, what, what he's interested in communicating concerning the things about which we have been instructed. Now, this preface, Love the Alexander has done an exhaustive research on prefaces in the ancient world and uh, has argued forcefully that this is a standard scientific preface, the kind of thing that you usually get in writings that are, are purporting to, to be scientific, to, to tell the truth. Now, the question is this. Do you believe Luke or not? Do you trust him or not? I suggest the burden, if you don't, why don't you? The burden's on you to show why you shouldn't. But even more fundamentally, if you are going to doubt him, if you're going to reject him, are you willing to apply that same criteria to everybody? Uh, Livy, uh, Suetonius, uh, Arian, the biographer of Alexander. Uh, I, I, are we going to have the equal sort of uh, intense hermeneutic of suspicion when we come to these ancient texts as well? Uh, all I would ask is that we treat the Gospels the same, the same sort of uh, preference we treat to all other ancient writings. Number four. Well, maybe having a short span of time doesn't guarantee the uh, introduction of legend. I suggest that uh, the, sh the, the short length of time in a Jewish culture is a strong argument against the idea that we are dealing with legend. It's important to remember that the earliest writings about the historical Jesus... Uh, that refer to and are impacted by the historical Jesus are not the Gospels. They're, they, they come from Paul. Now, a lot of scholars will argue that uh, the pastoral epistles are not Paul's and they're written later. And for the purposes of this debate, I'll grant you that. But if you just deal with the seven uh, letters of Paul that almost all scholars agree are from him and therefore written before 62 AD, you find some incredible things about, about how the early disciples saw Jesus. For example, they call him Lord. Lord. 
the Greek translation of the Tetragrammaton in the Old Testament, with a divine significance. That's incredible. We're talking about monotheistic Jews in the first century here, and they're calling a man who lived 20 years earlier, Lord, God. They believe he was resurrected. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is passing on a creed. He's reminding them of a creed they received. So he's not making this up on the spot. It's not like the resurrection story, 20, uh, the resurrection story started 20 years later. Uh, he's reminding them of something they already knew. So it predates him significantly and it has a creedal format as uh, scholars recognize. Jesus is worshipped. In fact, this characterizes all believers, Paul says, to all who in all places call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. This was the standard thing among early believers. They worshipped Jesus Christ. We're talking about monotheistic Jews here. Uh, he, they prayed to Jesus. Paul himself prayed to Jesus, often in the same breath as praying to God the Father. Uh, this is outstanding. Uh, you can show examples of how in, uh, in some segments, fringe segments of first century Judaism, people venerated intermediate beatings, but as Larry Hurtado and a number of others have argued, never did it cross the line into worship and uh, invocational prayer. Uh, Jesus is seen as the judge of the world in Paul, but only God is the judge of the world. He's seen as being the creator of the world, but only God is the creator of the world. Uh, Paul says in Philippians 2 that he is by very nature God and he's equal with God. And uh, scholars recognize this as being a, a, a traditional hymn. It's already in place in the early church. We're talking 20, 25 years after Jesus lived. Uh, this has already been in place. That's incredible. What, what explains that? That's what the, we need to have an explanation for that. He's God over all, blessed forever in Romans, and if you accept Colossians and Titus, he's the fullness of God in bodily form, and he's our great God and Savior. And so the question is this. We need to have a historical explanation for, for uh, uh, what, what must Jesus have been like to have impacted Jews against all of their cultural and religious presuppositions that this man could be God. What would explain that? I would submit to you that even if we didn't have the Gospels, we'd have to postulate or it'd be at least reasonable to postulate something close to the Jesus the Gospels give us just to explain the impact he had on the early uh, Christian community. Now, 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 Bob is among uh, a few, and there are just a few, scholars who argue uh, that Paul didn't believe that Jesus lived recently. He, he lived once upon a time, long, long ago, far, far away. And, and, and that helps, certainly, to, to put a span of time where legend could develop. But there's a number of arguments that I would raise if I had time against that. Right now, I'll just give one. Paul refers to James, the brother of Jesus, a number of times. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 1, Galatians 2, 9. Uh, he refers to, to, he refers to him as the brother of Jesus. Now, here's the question. Is it really plausible that you could have a legend about a guy, uh, just an ordinary man in a Jewish culture, that's significant, evolved within a span of 20, actually less than that, 20 years, to being the God of the universe while his brother is still alive? And his brother comes to believe it. And as part of it, while his mother is still alive, while his friends and his disciples are still alive, that I take to be something of a stretch. If you grant that Jesus was kind of who he said he was and did what the disciples say he did and rose from the dead and whatnot, I can now understand uh, how that could happen. But if Jesus was just a moral teacher or something of the sort, in a Jewish context, I can't understand that whatsoever. And just by way of kind of an incidental thing, we now have an, os an ossuary we found last year that has uh, the insignia James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus, and it's been dated uh, um, in the middle of the first century in Jerusalem. Uh, this, is, uh, this is significant. Uh, how many James, brother or son of Joseph, brother of Jesus were there at that time? And what's really significant is that they, they didn't put the, the siblings of the deceased on the ossuary unless they were famous. So how many James, son of Joseph, brother of a famous Jesus do you, do you have in the first century? Kind of anchors the whole thing. Okay, uh, another thing about the, uh, the uh, length of time is that the Gospels give us good reason to believe that they are in fact early or at least they contain uh, early material. Mark, for example, says in, in uh, chapter 15, they compelled a passerby who was coming from the country to carry his cross, the cross of Jesus. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And you say, so what? Well, here's what, so what? Clearly, Mark presupposes that Alexander and Rufus are known in the audience. And by the way, this was their father that carried the cross. 
Alexander and Rufus are, are contemporaries of theirs. If they're dead, they're recently dead. They're still in the memory, which means that Mark is writing in a kind of, within one generation of uh, the, the uh, earliest disciples. Secondly, they consistently and accurately reflect a pre-70 AD Palestinian environment. They assume the temple is still standing and the relationship between the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are just in place uh, as they were before 70, but that was radically altered after 70 AD. It was considerations like this that led uh, J.A.T. Robinson, who was a, who was a liberal uh, New Testament critic, to come to the conclusion in his book, Re The Redating of the New Testament, that all of the New Testament documents should be dated before 70 A.D. That pushes them very close to the events they're talking about. The other thing is that there's a unanimous uh, acceptance of the traditional authorship of the Gospels in the second century. If, if they were just making up names, why they do that, I don't know, but if they were just making up names, um, how did they acquire this authority, and why is there a, a unanimous agreement about this? As Martin Hengel points out, there's no disagreement about this. It's just assumed. Uh, that's significant. Some of the testimony about the authorships of the, of the Gospels is really interesting because it includes some interesting detail. For example, as uh, Bob pointed out, Papias mentions that Mark wrote down what Peter was, was uh, uh, preaching, and the Gospel is really the Gospel of Peter through, through Mark. Um, we, we find in the, in the, pre, uh, in the preface to the, the uh, Muratorian canon that Mark is described as a person who's got real, he had stubby fingers. In fact, he had a nickname, meant, meant stub fingers. Those sorts of things, I think, really help you know, anchor our confidence that Mark wrote Mark. And if they're going to make up names, why? I'm not sure. But if they're going to make up names, why would they make up Mark? Why would they make up Luke? These people weren't even in the inner circle, not even eyewitnesses, not main players in, in the story. You would have thought they'd make up a gospel of Paul or a gospel of Peter or something of that sort. So I, I take it that we've got at least reasonable grounds for assuming that the authorship is the traditional authorship and the writing close to the event. And that... That increases the ver our, our, our estimation of the veracity of these documents. The implication is this. As uh, a and Sherwin White argued, uh, in comparing Herodotus with the Gospels, both uh, record stuff 40 to 70 years after the event. He says, Herodotus enables us to test the temple of myth-making. It's the ordinary temple of, uh, of myth-making. And in a pagan culture, and it's different in a Jewish culture, as I'll say in a second here, but the test suggests that even two generations are too short a span of time to allow the mythical tendency to prevail over the hard historical core of oral tradition. And that, that under most circumstances, that, that holds. This is especially true when you have living witnesses that are there. It's especially true when you have hostile witnesses who are there. True, maybe you can't prove math with a mathematical certainty that they could have contained it, but they would be a force that would contain it. It's especially true in a Jewish culture that resisted the, mytho the mythologizing tendency, and it's especially true in a, in a Jewish culture that had a strong emphasis on oral tradition, which leads to my fifth point. First century Palestinian Judaism resisted pagan influences. Now, there, there's really good grounds for arguing that they were uh, influenced by the Hellenization process in terms of their language and in some areas in terms of their culture. But as uh, archaeologists like Jonathan Reed and Eric Myers and others have shown, and other first century scholars like E.P. Sanders uh, and, and others have shown, um, there's very good evidence that, with very few exceptions, this didn't encroach at all on, on the religious faith of the Jewish people. In fact, being in a pagan environment under pagan uh, control, uh, under the oppression of the Roman government, tended to intensify the resistance to mythology especially on the Theos Aner tradition, the idea that a man could become divinized. This was repugnant to the Orthodox Jew. But this is exactly the quote-unquote myth that the Christians came up with against all of their cultural presuppositions. Legends usually occur in, 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 uh, uh, and take on the flavor of the culture that bursts them. In fact, usually they express and reinforce uh, the cultural social, social assumptions that they're birthed in. But the Christian myth quote-unquote, uh, goes, uh, flies in the face of it. Sixthly, the first century Palestinian Judaism, Judaism stressed oral tradition. They had a strong emphasis on preserving sacred oral tradition. There's been a number of studies now on uh, the role of oral traditions in uh, not just the first century, but even today in, in, in oral cultures. And what they're finding is that there is a, a flexibility, but there is also a core of, of the oral tradition that is considered to be untouchable. And if someone screws that up, they're, they're, people notice that. There's checks and balances. 
And in the first century, where there was a special emphasis put on oral tradition, passing on sacred tradition, Paul uses those words actually in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, it's just not the kind of uh, context in which it would be conducive to just be uh, birthing myths. Point number seven. If first century Palestinian Jews would have and could have created a legend, I submit to you it would not have looked like the Christian story. It wouldn't have looked like this. This is a, an especially important point because two of the uh, cri- criteria for authenticity uh, that the Jesus Seminar used is the embarrassment criteria and the dissimilarity criteria. If something would have been embarrassing, you can, it, that's, it makes it more likely that it goes back to the historical Jesus because communities don't create things that embarrass themselves. Or dissimilar, dissimilarity, if they create things that are, that are uh, uh, or if you find things that are against the cultural assumptions and against the religious beliefs, it's more likely that they didn't create that, since people usually don't create theological structures that are dissimilar to them. When you turn to the Christian story, here's what you find. Jesus was a cursed and crucified Messiah. They weren't expecting that. He cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's amazing that that stayed in the tradition and didn't get lopped off, even if it did happen. But there's certainly no grounds for thinking, seeing how it could encroach in on the legend if it never happened in the first place. Why would someone include that as part of the story when they're trying to preach Jesus as the Messiah? Jesus' divine claims and authority. That was not expected. They, his, his claims and the authority that he spoke with, putting himself on a par with the Old Testament, it was shocking to the crowd. It would have been shocking to the Jewish disciples. It's not what was expected. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead before the eschaton, before the end of the age. The, most Jews had a belief in the, in the resurrection of the dead at the end of the age when everyone's raised. But the idea of an individual being raised in the present age was utterly new. We've got to explain that. How, how do you get that, that uniqueness? If Jesus rose from the dead, I can explain it. If he didn't, well, now you just have to appeal to the cre- creative imaginations of people, and I think that is more difficult. The disciples throughout the Gospels are extraordinarily dull. Think about yourself. If you're, if you're creating stories about your, your heroes, do you make them look like idiots? But frankly, the Gospels portray the disciples looking quite a bit like idiots. Jesus is saying, you know, love your enemies. A few minutes later, they're calling down fire from heaven to try to incinerate a city. They don't get it. They're just dull. Uh, and that, I suggest to you, is, is, is an argument in favor of, of the fact that they're just passing on things as they, as they happen. Jesus' own family doesn't uh, uh, believe him in the Gospels. Now, that's the kind of thing that, that legend leaves out. His own disciple, his own family doubts him. You have women who discover the tomb being empty. Where are the guys? They're hiding away, scared in, 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 in a room. Now, this is a strongly patriarchal culture where women are regarded as being incurable liars. I submit to you, there's no motive why they'd have women be uh, at the tomb or why that would just creep up in legend unless it actually happened that way. You have Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and prostitutes, which was a scandal. And to this day, the church hasn't got the message about uh, loving like he loves to the point where you attract tax collectors and prostitutes. You have inexplicable sayings and events in Jesus that, that were, were troubling to everybody. Uh, you know, someone says, uh, uh, Lord, what, what good thing must I do to enter heaven? And he says, why do you call me good? Now, that's odd. That's an odd thing. And the church has struggled over that. But it's certainly not the kind of thing that a legend that's trying to promote him as the Messiah, uh, as, as God's presence here on earth, would, would, would make up. Uh, in Mark 6, it admits that Jesus could do no, mighty, no, no miracles in his hometown. Uh, that's not the kind of thing that legends bring forth. And that further substantiates the reliability. Point number eight, there's a multi, the multitude of early sources uh, suggest the reliability. Uh, realize that much of history, as I said earlier, depends on single sources, often written long after the fact. But that doesn't trouble historians too much. Uh, they work with it. For example, most of what we know about the Persian Wars comes from Herodotus, writing roughly 70 years after the event. Most of what, or a good deal of what we know from Alexander the Great comes from one source, Arian, writing four centuries after the event. Uh, much of what we know about the first century comes from Josephus, and Josephus alone writing sometimes 90 years after the event that he records. Most of what we know about, or much of what we know about the Middle Ages, comes from St. Bede, writing sometimes 200 years after the sources, and that's considered a good history. When we're talking about Jesus and the early church and the goings-on of the first century, we've got a dozen sources within the first 70, 80 years, even on liberal dating. Uh, and and uh, it, they're just all over the place. Add to that the fact that you've got a multitude of other sources in the next hundred years after that. And there are varying degrees of historical reliability. I will grant that. 
Uh, and yet, uh, the, the sheer number and proximity is, I think, an argument in its favor. And the final point I think I'll have time to argue for is, is number nine. The Gospels contain a wealth of irrelevant, vivid detail. And that is characteristic of eyewitness testimony. It's not characteristic of legends. Uh, Wolfgang Schadenwald, who was the foremost, uh, probably the foremost Homer scholar of all time, was invited to Tübingen, uh, to their liberal faculty, to discuss his perspective on the history of the Gospels. And I think he, he surprised them when he said this. We cannot be other than captivated by the experiential vividness with which we are confronted in the Gospels. I know of no other, this is the guy who knows this stuff, I know of no other area of history writing, biography or poetry, where I, where I encounter so great a wealth of material in such a small space, uh, in such a small space. Any one of these, of course, you could have suspicions about. Do any one of these prove the case? No. But taken together, they constitute, I submit to you, uh, a good, good foundation for believing that the Gospels are generally reliable and give us the historical Jesus. The Christ of their faith is the Christ of history. Thank you. Okay, uh, batten down the hatches. Do the gospel authors claim to be eyewitnesses? No. There's a couple of things in the Gospel of John that appear to be interpolations, chapters 18 and the whole of chapter 21 appendices. Uh, but uh, what about Luke's preface? Loveday Alexander actually says that uh, it sounds most like that of uh, ancient treatises on, ag on agriculture, which means that the parallel is meaningless. Uh, Luke's preface also sounds like a great deal, a great deal like those of ancient novels, uh, which are, are uh, astonishingly like two or three of them, which claim they've investigated and it's all history, whereas everyone knows it's completely fictitious. Uh, Josephus also says in Jewish antiquities he's going to only present what the Bible says and nothing else, and of course he completely rewrites it. First John uh, says he saw something but makes no reference to anything but the fact that Jesus had a flesh and blood body and gave the love commandment. That doesn't carry us very far. Uh, were ancient Jews as far back as we can trace open to uh, pagan influences? You bet they were. The earliest known synagogues in Palestine show mosaic representations of Yahweh as Zeus driving a chariot through the wheel of the zodiac. There are pictures of Hercules on synagogue walls. Uh, in Egyptian Jewish casket, you have the menorah and the resurrected god Attis. Uh, so there's all kinds of uh, evidence uh, for that. Uh, are we willing to uh, be just as critical of other ancient historians? You bet. Just read any of the history and, and debate about any ancient document. Uh, the, the historians are far from taking any of these ancient writers simply at their word. Would Jewish culture prohibit uh, the distortion of tradition or the deification of someone? Well, take a look at Sabbatai Tzvi. Uh, Judaism in his day was even more like it is today with rabbinic Judaism, and yet he persuaded a lot of people to accept him as he signed his letters as your Lord and God, Sabbatai Tzvi. Jewish monotheism was not completely established in the time of Jesus. Uh, there were, as Greg points out, Enoch, Melchizedek, and others who were exalted saviors, and Hurtado desperately claims that this is a little different than early Christian worship because they never worshipped Enoch. Does Paul ever pray to Jesus? I don't think he does. He prays through Jesus, etc. Uh, we can uh, say that uh, we can imagine Jews were monotheistic and would never have come up with any of this stuff, but uh, in that case, Al Hakim, the uh, Islamic. Uh, Caliph in the 11th century must have been God because fiercely monotheistic Muslims proclaimed him God. Why, does Jesus, uh, why is Jesus allowed to quote Psalm 22, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Psalm 22 is used to fill out the non-existent story of the crucifixion for which there was no historical memory. Why the heck not uh, if it were a historical event? The, the epistles uh, give such little date on Jesus, uh, with nothing about him, uh, his uh, doing any miracles, that it actually gave rise to the extreme Christ myth theory. Uh, so, so little does it have about Jesus, so little does it reflect any of his teaching. Uh, the presence in the so-called Pauline epistles of liturgical and creedal and traditional material militates against their authentic uh, Pauline authorship, in my opinion. It's just absurd for Paul to tell people 
to keep the traditions he taught them a month ago, or tradition. Disciples were not heroes to everyone in the uh, Gospels. Marcion and many other early Christians thought they were fools and depicted them so, so as to discredit Jewish Christianity, which revered them. It's no surprise they're treated as bums. Uh, the brother of the Lord. Well, could mean that he was literally the brother of Jesus, but Paul calls himself and Apollos the co-workers of God. Did they, live, did they work in the same office with the Almighty? Brothers of the Lord could mean a lot of things. This ossuary or bone box recently discovered, people that have seen it, I have not, claim now that uh, the uh, brother of the Lord is added by a different hand. That one still is, is uh, up for grabs. Alexander and Rufus need only have been famous people. Perhaps they were martyrs. Nothing says they were, they were recent. Uh, was there no pre-eschatological resurrection? Uh, well, John the Baptist, the Gospels tell us, was widely believed to be raised from the dead. The disciples could have gotten the idea from there. It certainly was not unprecedented. No text associates Jesus with prostitutes. John the Baptist, yes, Jesus is not said to have been a friend of the ladies of the night. Mark and Luke were chosen uh, as non-apostolic names for Gospels after the fact precisely because Matthew was the favorite of the early church. His was attributed to a disciple. These were seen to disagree in order and content with Matthew, so they chose non-apostolic names on purpose. There were people in the early church who believed the Gospel of John was actually written by the Gnostic Serinthus or Marcion. Uh, so it's, it's not all that, uh, that clear. Mark the stump finger. That is a polemical uh, slur uh, making Mark into Marcion, Mark the less, implying he didn't know how to write a gospel. Where would they have gotten the idea of women at the tomb? Well, from the resurrection myths of Osiris, where it's women and not men who go to the tomb. That of Attis and various, and of Baal and various other dying and rising gods. Greg has a good point. The burden of proof is on the one to, that takes my view to say there's reason to doubt that the Gospels are accurate. I didn't go into that. Uh, let me just briefly say reasons I think there's a lot of funny business going on. There are contradictions between the teachings of Jesus and the Gospels. What did Jesus teach on fasting? Christians do it. Christians don't do it. Christians don't do it now, but will do it later. Compare Mark and Matthew. Uh, will the kingdom of God come with signs to be observed? You can contrast uh, Mark and Luke and elsewhere in Luke. Is divorce allowable? Contrast uh, Matthew with Mark and Luke. Should you pray succinctly as in the Lord's Prayer or again and again as in Luke 18? Should you keep the least of these commandments or did Jesus declare all foods clean? Do you need only to repent or must you believe that Jesus is the Son of God or die in your sins? Uh, should we associate with publicans a la Mark or shun them a la Matthew? Did Jesus teach in secret as in Mark or in open as in John? There are contradictions between gospel events. Did John the Baptist recognize Jesus or not? Did Jesus cleanse the temple at the beginning or the end of the ministry? Did Jesus die on Passover as in John or the day after as in the others? Uh, did uh, Jesus visit Jerusalem once before he died or many times as in John? Uh, was John the Baptist Elijah? Two Gospels say yes, two say no. What did Peter say at his confession? There are four different answers in the Gospels. Did Jesus carry his own cross? John says yes, the synoptics no. How many angels at the tomb? Which women at the tomb? Where were the resurrection appearances? There are anachronisms in Jesus' teachings where he, meant he settles debates that couldn't have come up yet. Uh, there are historical anachronisms. The Gospels portray the Palestine after uh, 70, etc. Well, okay. All right. Um, where to begin? Where to begin? Where to begin? Um, I, I, I'll begin with uh, just uh, one, one, one final word about the, the legend parallel, since uh, a whole lot is leveraged on that. I can't go through all the various parallels that uh, were, were put out, but it, Sabbatai Savi was, was brought up quite a bit, and it kind of illustrates the radical difference between uh, the accounts about Sabbatai Savi and those of the Gospels. Uh, just some of the differences, um, and I'm getting all my my I'm getting most of my information from the same source that Bob is, uh, the book that was written about him. But the opponents uh, denied that he did, ever did miracles, uh, and um, even his own main prophet, Nathan, denied that he did miracles. Uh, there, were, there were historical followers who said he was doing miracles, but those closest to him didn't uh, affirm that. 
the stories that are told are largely in keeping with the expectations of the time. And this is the, there, there is a difference between first century Judaism and the Judaism that was entrenched in the environment where Sabbatai Sevi was, was uh, preaching. Uh, they were very apocalyptic at the time. That wasn't different. But they were very much into Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah, and other things. And a lot of the uh, pronouncements of Sabbatai Sevi fit very well with that, uh, that Kabbalistic uh, tradition. Sabbatai Sevi was generally regarded, even by his temporary contemporaries, as being mentally ill. Uh, he provided no exceptional teaching or insight, unlike Jesus, uh, where you, you can't get the impression that this guy is, is, is crazy. Sabbatai recanted his messiahship, as Bob pointed out, when he was captured by the Muslims. He converted to Islam and encouraged others to do so. Uh, that, of course, is very different from Jesus. It does show uh, that a good instance of how incredible, how uh, people can believe despite incredible odds, but in terms of finding historical explanations for it, you're dealing with a very different kind of person than you're dealing with the person of Jesus Christ. Most followers of Sabbatai uh, uh, rejected the claim that he, that he was resurrected. Uh, it was based on no eyewitness accounts. The predictions that he would appear never materialized. The story of his empty tomb, and there's one account of that, that was supposedly guarded by a giant dragon, can be shown to have gone through different uh, uh, stages of development. And uh, in my understanding, if, if I recall the book right, he was never worshipped as God. Uh, he was worshipped as a, you know, as a, not venerated as a great angel, but never worshipped as God. Um, in terms of Loveday's analysis, maybe we have different readings of that, but I, I take her point to be true. It applied to, to agriculture because that's where most of the scientific the science of the day was written. But it does show the intent is to record history. Now, does that mean that we uh, therefore have, shouldn't have any critical thinking about it? No, but it certainly shows the burden of proof is on the part of the uh, historian than, uh, rather than on, on the uh, document under investigation. In terms of pagan influence, uh, we have different accounts of this, and, and, and scholars differ on this. But certainly in Galilee, uh, you have a, uh, a, a resistance, strong resistance, and it's, all, it's outside of that as well, but a strong resistance to uh, the encroaching of, of Hellenistic culture. In Alexandria, perhaps uh, you could make the case, but uh, not in uh, Palestine, in the Galilee area. Um, in terms of Paul's lack of, of Jesus' teaching, remember what, what the purpose of the, the, the epistles are for. He is writing congregations who already have a foundation in place. It wouldn't be the time to... He's not there to give a history of Jesus. He's there to confront church problems. That's what all the epistles are about. And so in that context, it makes very good sense for him to be applying theological truths and to reminding them of things that they have already been taught. It's not surprising at all that he invokes traditional material. I'm a pastor of a church, and that's mostly what I do. Uh, people will forget that kind of thing. Uh, it's true he and Apollos describe themselves as co-workers of God, but in the context, he's, it, it, that, that doesn't mean... Well, how do you go from saying I'm a co-worker with God? He, he's, he portrays the whole church, all believers, as that. We're the body of Christ. But the brother of Jesus is a very distinct thing. And I think that's an important point. Uh, it, because if, if the brother of the guy that you're calling God of the universe is, is, is hanging around... And we know that there was a lot of traveling that went on in the early church. Cephas went to Corinth, and, and Apollos, and these folks were not isolated. Paul went to, to Jerusalem to make sure that they were on the same page and whatnot. In that kind of a context, people know who James is, and you, you just can't go around spinning out tall tales about your brother. Um, I, I don't know why... I'll, well, I'll have to go back and check, but it seems to me there's two texts that, deal, that specifically mention that Jesus... Had, wherever he went, they, they were, they, the tax collectors and prostitutes follow him. And I can't remember the, the passages off, the offhand, the but uh, we, we just have a difference of kind of a fact there. Um, in, in terms of uh, that they chose names because they had a lower estimation of them, I, I just don't uh, find that to be a plausible reading. Nor uh, the, the uh, idea that Stumpfinger was a, uh, a pun. Um, that, that is a way you could read it, but the, the, face, the, the surface reading of it is that he's just referring to a characteristic of him, a, a nickname that he was given. And it seems to me that it, uh, if these texts are going to be the authoritative text for the early church, um, that they're, they're, they've got to be reliable enough for, for people to be basing their lives on. Uh, these are people who have a lot to lose by being wrong. And uh, so to think that, well, we don't think this, this gospel is, is reputable enough to give it the name of an apostle, let's give the name of, of, of somebody else, uh, strikes me as being implausible. Uh, in terms of the contradictions, uh, you know, the, the, people have known about this for a very, very, very long time, as, as early as the second century. And, of course, there's ways of, of, uh, of accounting for those. Um, but 
whether you agree with the ways that you can reconcile the contradictions or not, I don't think any of them are very difficult. They're all about minor matters. But there aren't that. So to my knowledge, there's no case in history where you have two or more accounts of the same event where you don't have those kind of tensions. You know, uh, the guy who wrote, who, who did, did, did the movie Titanic, researched all the stuff that was written about the Titanic, and he said what was amazing, Cameroon, I think is his name, was that here we have 1,500 people who saw the thing ship, and the counts are so different. You know, did the chimney break, did it not break, or, or, or whatever. That's kind of normal where you have different sub perspectives. The Gospels just reflect that. You have different sources. It shows that they weren't. Uh, you know, getting together a party line and, and uh, that they're, they, they express relatively independent perspectives. Having said all that, I'll end with this in my last 20 seconds. I've been talking about Jesus as a historical hypothesis, but of course, uh, the Christ that the church proclaims is not a historical hypothesis. You need to deal with history, but my claim up here, as I'm talking to you right here, right now, is this. Yeah, we need to deal with this historical hypothesis stuff and argue that, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus is a living reality. And uh, a, a, a presence that you can get into, a, a, a personal relationship you can have that sustains your life, transforms your life, renews your mind, sets you free. And you can get to know him with the same kind of reality you know a, a human person. I, you, know, you talk with him, you walk with him, you live with him. And, and of course, if you're, you might be saying, well, that's just a psychological, emotional, subjective thing. But I'm telling you, it's, it's a reality. And uh, when all is said and done, that's the thing that matters most. i got to cut. Thank you. All right, Dr. Barchi, he earned his Ph.D. at Harvard. After teaching some time in Germany, he came to UCLA to be a professor. His specialties are on the history of religions in general and Christian origins in particular. He is also the author of an upcoming book called No Man Father. He's also currently teaching a class called Jesus of Nazareth in Contemporary Historical Research, which I hope to get an A in after tonight. <laughs> He is an outstanding historian, emphasizing the importance of the social context of the New Testament. Please welcome Dr. Barchi. Really, you didn't come here uh, to have me ask questions, but to have you ask questions. So I just uh, I could uh, be in dialogue with these guys for the rest of uh, rest of the, the week. Uh, but I'd like to address one question to each, and then I'll get out of the way. Uh, at the end of what you had to say, uh, uh, Dr. Price, you were saying that certain approaches to these texts have made it very uh, difficult, very difficult for some people, uh, presumably yourself as well, uh, to, as you put it, unlock the precious treasures of the text and although I'm sure you could take hours to talk about this I think it would be helpful for you to give us some clue about what those precious treasures might be if we approached it correctly and with respect uh, to you Dr. Boyd I would like for you to address the question uh, who is God according to Jesus and in this way of constructing things why do the Gospels make this so clear that Jesus is not God, does to say that Jesus is praying to God, Jesus is asking, not my will, but yours be done. So what's going on with the way in which that language then, which is there, certainly in Colossians, certainly in John, uh, in which Jesus is functionally identified as the one who's calling the shots. But I ask the question with a certain urgency because what I see in the history of the church is not Jesus' divinity being forgotten, but rather his humanity you move in the creed from born from the Virgin Mary to crucified under Pontius Pilate. Sure. And I have uh, wave after wave of students who would tell me that they believe that the Bible is infallible and they believe that Jesus died for their sins, but they've never read the Gospel of Mark. Uh, they have no clue as to who the historical Jesus really was or what his program was. And that's why we have so many churches in Southern California where people are driving in with their big cars. At the same time, we have so many homeless people. Uh, there's no connection being made between being saved and getting with the program. They don't know what the program is because they don't know what the historical Jesus was up to or even the people that he did hang out with, whether it was prostitutes or tax collectors, whoever it was, it was clearly a lot of marginalized folks. So what I find happening in the history of the church is you identify Jesus with God, then whether you do it as drastically as the Gnostics or somebody else, you have your own idea who God is. Constantine's God was still Zeus. It was a kick-ass God. And you get Jesus identified with that, 
and you have Christians then who have been killing people ever since. Gotcha. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? So sure. talk a little bit about that, first of all, uh, please, Mr. Price. Mm. Well, I think that, for instance, the, just as with uh, the belief in inerrancy uh, and infallibility forced people to believe, I mean, logically seems to force them to believe that uh, the, uh, the lumber yard of uh, Nehemiah or Second Chronicles is on the same level with the Sermon on the Mount or Isaiah, which insults the good stuff and, and exalts the bad uh, to the embarrassment of the Bible. The evangelical uh, subset of that doctrine, that everything Jesus is said to have said and done in the Gospels is accurate. Uh, stops us from understanding where various gospel sayings and stories originally came from, probably, and what they meant. Uh, and I feel there is nothing more pious than understanding the text. Uh, so for me, the uh, the uh, more likely or, or, or the earlier levels of probable meaning of the text are treasures to be discovered. And just a couple of examples of this. Um, if Jesus actually said to the crowd, whoever who wants to follow him must take up his cross and, and come after him, well, then uh, you, ha you have to start harmonizing and saying, well, in fact, nobody yet knew about the crucifixion. So what on earth could he have been talking about? What, what, assuming he wanted people to hear him, he just, Mark says he calls the crowd to him and says this. What was he talking about? It's really hard to say. Uh, some people say, well, was he, was he uh, quoting some zealot recruitment thing? Whereas if you realize that obviously this is a post-historical Jesus saying that, that assumes the reader knows Jesus went to the cross and that real discipleship, not cheap grace, means you have to be willing to do the same thing. Whatever the fate laid out for you by being consistently committed to your faith, that's what you have to do if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, if, if you realize that, uh, and, and the, at the price of saying Jesus couldn't have said it, uh, then you have a restored treasure rather than something gambled away in the name of an arbitrary dogma that, oh no, he, he must actually have said it. If he did say it, we don't know what he was talking about. But, but he obviously, we know what it means. And that implies, sorry, he didn't say it. Not that it matters much to me, but, but there's a recovered treasure. You could say the same thing about the Great Commission. Jesus couldn't have said that or you wouldn't have. Well, no, I see the cut sign. Good enough. Yeah. Uh, we have three minutes for this. Is that, is that it? Three? Three? I, I can't see you. Right. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, a very good question. There is uh, a dynamic that you find in the Gospels that's not resolved, really, until the 4th century. And even then, it's not resolved. It's more relabeled. Uh, between uh, Jesus as God and Jesus as the Son of God, um, on the one hand, he refers to Jesus, or, uh, Jesus refers to God as Abba, Father, praise to him, submits to him. I've come not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and things of that sort. On the other hand, he, uh, off, he speaks of the divine authority and makes claims uh, that are, are divine claims. You know, blessed are you when, you when you're persecuted for my sake. That's not how rabbis talked in those days. Putting his own authority on, on a par with, with the uh, uh, Old Testament. And even in, in inspiring people to, to worship him. And he doesn't refuse that. So there's both this otherness to God and this presence of God through Jesus Christ. He comes to be seen as the representative of God. Um, it is true that uh, after the uh, resurrection, and especially into the, well, it didn't take very long, second century on, uh, sometimes in the light of the resurrection and the salvation that Christ brought, uh, there was a tendency to bifurcate his divinity from his humanity or even lose his humanity altogether. Um, and a great deal is, is lo in fact, the essence of things is lost when we do that. The Gospels are very clear that Jesus is fully human. Uh, he was in all respects made like we are, it says in Hebrews. He grew in wisdom and stature. It says in wisdom and stature. It says in, in Luke uh, chapter 2. Uh, he was perfected by the things which he suffered. It says in Hebrews 5. They had a, a robust understanding of Jesus' humanity. Um, what was amazing is that he, as this human being, represented God here on earth. The God that he represented, he talked about and illustrated. And that really is subsumed under the rubric of the kingdom of God, the domain of God. And that's what Jesus most fundamentally came to be. He was the bringer of the domain in which God is going to reign. And in doing that, he came against the domain in which Satan was reigning. 
And so you see that by his teachings, you see that by his deeds, he, he proclaimed and illustrated the God of the oppressed, the God of the outsiders, the marginalized, uh, the demonized, the sick. Uh, wherever he went, there were prostitutes and tax collectors that followed him. It was, it was a God of outrageous love. He, he prayed to, spoke about, and illustrated Abba Father kind of love. Um, and uh, uh, when, 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 when you just look at the salvation, what you end up is with a for me religion that is self-indulgent. Uh, I, you know, everyone says, well, how can Jesus bless me? But you lose that, that radical discipleship that's so much a part of the gospel. Dallas Willard, who was here just a few days ago, wrote the best book on this that I think has been written for years. And that is A Divine Conspiracy. We're called to be uh, disciples of, of the human Jesus. Amen. I'm starting to preach there a little bit, I think. And I'm here to tell you today. Can I get a witness? Good evening, Dr. Price and Dr. Boyd. Um, on behalf of the Associated Secular Students on campus here, I would just like to direct my remarks to uh, Dr. Price. Uh, it, you seem to suggest in your opening comments that it is not essential to a belief in Christianity that uh, one necessarily believe in the historical Jesus. And uh, our question for you tonight is, do you think that, um, in light of this fact, what, what kind of Christianity would this be? And uh, why would this be a desirable position to take? It uh, resonates with me on a deep uh, aesthetic uh, level and that of moral challenge. Uh, it, to me, the kind of faith one needs in any religion is only what Coleridge called the poetic faith of the temporary willing suspension of disbelief, uh, not an opinion on whether miracles happen or that Jesus existed or was this or that. Uh, it, uh, it would be a kind of demythologized faith that makes no claims of the supernatural, uh, which is, you know, could be true, but seems to me irrelevant. Uh, I have no idea whether there's any life after death, and for a lot of people, would, they'd say, well, no, we've got to have that in Christianity. I just don't think so. I think Pascal was right that uh, uh, Christianity uh, and other religions, though he wouldn't have said that, uh, are, uh, they do repay the effort to, to live a, a beautiful and profound way of life with a lot of uh, poetic uh, color and, and moral challenge without it being a raft of Possible beliefs. I don't think so. That's what I love about skeptics and humanists that they oppose bunk science and, and fraudulent claims that you can prove things that in fact you cannot prove. And uh, I'm, I'm on their side with that. I tend to think they, they're, they, are a little short on the aesthetic value of uh, and the the deep uh, psychological importance of myth and ritual, as Jung pointed out. It's nothing superstitious. There's nothing supernatural about it, uh, in my opinion. But it, it repays involvement in a kind of poetic, dramatic way. Where that's all the claims I make for it. But to me, that is a profound and, and fulfilling thing. Oh, thank you. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next question is going to be presented by John Book. He is the director of Campus Crusade for Christ here on the UCLA campus. And go ahead. If you have some more questions, feel free to start. I know you, sir, uh, were eager to go. Uh, please go ahead and start laying up the mics. And we're going to try to get through as many as we can. So thank you. Hi, question for Dr. Price. And uh, you can just correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the Jesus Seminar's criterion of dissimilarity is that if a saying of Jesus can be shown to have a parallel in Jewish culture or the early church, it's judged to be inauthentic. Uh, and there, there's a class of Jesus' sayings, namely the eschatological son of man sayings, that would seem to pass that criterion. And yet my understanding is the Jesus Seminar throws them out as inauthentic. And I wanted to ask you, if, if that's correct, why that would be the case. Well, I, I think they're way too um, positive and optimistic about gospel accuracy. They think about 18% of the sayings of Jesus in the Gospels are authentic. I think that's way too uh, optimistic because I think they're inconsistent on the application of the dissimilarity criterion. And that criterion doesn't say we can be sure he didn't say it if it sounds Jewish or Hellenistic. It's just that the, since there's so many parallels, virtually everything Jesus says in the Gospels can be paralleled almost verbatim from uh, rabbinic and, and stoic and 
cynic sources. The point, rather, is that uh, you just can't be sure he did say it. He might well have said it, but uh, it's impossible to be sure since people attributed these sayings to whoever. The Son of Man sayings, though, uh, that gets to be tricky because Son of Man was used, as I'm sure you probably know, in a couple of different ways. Sometimes it was just a humble self-reference to the, the Son of Man must die. It might be a way of saying, uh, God, God forbid, but I have to die. Uh, sometimes it refers to the one like a Son of Man in Daniel 7, and though it was apparently ne never used as a title as such, as a shorthand reference to Daniel 7, it appears all over the place in 4th Ezra and first Enoch and all that and so these apocalyptic son of man sayings that they say I think based on an argument by Norman Perrin probably are just quotes from these these books or at least there's no good reason to think they aren't since Jesus is also shown elsewhere saying the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed that would pass the dissimilarity criteria they would say since that's so unusual in contemporary Judaism so they'd say son of the coming of one like a son of man to stock uh, Jewish uh, opinion and, and clashes with another that's attributed to Jesus. So I think that's why they rejected. But they're inconsistent on that criterion. Go ahead, sir. I just have a brief uh, comment uh, regarding uh, Dr. Robert Price. For those of you who may be seduced or uh, disconcerted by his uh, analysis, there's a very healthy antidote in the form of uh, C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, in which he describes uh, the human hubris to deconstruct, which eventually ends up in uh, rejecting objective reality. And I think if you read that uh, particular slim volume by C.S. Lewis, I think you'll be strengthened in um, your notion that perhaps uh, Dr. Robert Price's analysis is a more deconstruction and reflects uh, uh, human hubris. Uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Price, uh, Mary Magdalene was a reformed or repentant prostitute, and G Jesus ro uh, washed her feet. Well, that all depends on what the word Magdalene means. The rabbis uh, applied it to the mother of Jesus and thought it was based on a pun for an Aramaic word that sounds much like it that means hairdresser, implying uh, prostitute madam. And if that's what it really means in the Gospels, then that would be evidence. But it, it, as it is now, it's, uh, the Gospel writers seem to think it means Mary of Magdala, and, uh, and she isn't actually called a prostitute. She's not identified with I think, Luke Seven's woman who is a sinner who probably is supposed to be one but I don't believe it actually ever says Jesus is said to hang around with uh, uh, tax collectors and sinners but uh, it's John the Baptist who in Luke is said to have uh, found a reception among tax collectors and prostitutes so that's why I say I don't believe Jesus is said to have associated with prostitutes though he may have uh, thank you uh, Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your insights with us tonight. I do really appreciate it. And my question is uh, directed to uh, Dr. Boyd. Uh, earlier in your presentation, you did mention that uh, Jesus was rendered worship and that Paul especially uh, bowed down and worshipped him as the Son and the Father, putting them pretty much on an equal basis, if I understood that correctly. Um, my question is... Um, <laughs> It's multi-layered, but I think some, you, know, you can probably hit it out with one shot. Um, uh, John, Jesus is uh, known in the three Gospels especially, but uh, uh, even in John, which is the most deifying Gospel of Jesus, uh, in 423, he says that uh, now is the time that the true worshiper, worshipers will worship the Father, for the Father is uh, seeking out such worshipers. Uh, so the emphasis there from Jesus himself is that the Father is the one to be worshipped um, <clears throat> and this, this worshipping of Jesus, what form has it taken? If you're speaking of the Greek word uh, prosku proskunio, uh, that, that, uh, that has several meanings uh, in my reading. I mean, it's kissing the hands of a just king, uh, kneeling before or crouching before. We have examples of in the Jewish tradition in the Old Testament where Abigail bows herself before David, where uh, also Ju Joseph's brothers bow themselves prostrate on the ground before Joseph. I would dare not call that worship or that they would be putting those figures on the same level with the Father as uh, Paul did. 
uh, and the notion of the, 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 the son of God. I mean, God has sons by the tons uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, Ephraim, Israel, his firstborn. Uh, David, uh, Solomon is the son of God. Adam is the son of God. Uh, blessed are the uh, peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So even Jimmy Carter, by that criteria, would probably be uh, one of God's sons. Um, but what makes Jesus so special, especially in the vernacular of, of, the, uh, of the Jews, where they use this title, son of God, and why is it that all of the Old Testament prophets taught uh, strict monotheism uh, Abraham and Noah and David and Solomon and uh, Jacob and Isaiah you name it okay. and then all of a sudden at the time of please, Jesus uh, please, God please reveals the secret uh, Sorry. this is it this is it yeah um, okay okay uh, the uh, what, what, what's, what's really clear is that Jesus is using the term son of God in reference to himself in a very distinct sense uh, in fact, he sometimes distinguishes my father from your father, and no man knows the son but the father. No man knows the father but the son, and, and he to whom uh, he shall reveal him. That's found in Matthew. It's, uh, it sounds like John, but it's actually out of Matthew. And so there's a distinct relationship he always presupposes. Um, there's distinct claims that he makes uh, that are not made of ordinary human beings. This is why people you know, wanted to stone him. This is why he was such an outrage. Um, he does his acts uh, as, as uh, a demonstration of the unique authority that, that he has. And that's why you have a whole uh, you know, thing surrounding him uh, that uh, the, the tradition he leaves makes claims about him that, that are unheard of for Jews to make claims about uh, an individual. I mean, for example, in John, where he says, if you see me, you see the Father. Or in uh, John 5, 23, I've come down from heaven that all may honor the Father, er, honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. That's an outrageous, blasphemous thing to say uh, for an, an Orthodox Jew, unless he's telling the truth. Um, and so the, the claims that are made of him and the deeds that he does, the things that he says, uh, are, are just put him in a, in a different category. He's using Son of God in a par excellence way. It's true. It can just mean something as a, a God-like one or a, a godly person. But in the context of the Gospels, it's very different. Proskune is a word that has, you're right, it can just mean obeisance when done to a king. But the context determines the usage. And I would submit to you that, that in Matthew 28, for example, in verse 7 and verse 19, when Jesus, after the resurrection, shows up and says, All hail, and they fall at his feet and worship him, that's a religious context. It's not just paying homage. One indication of this is that, that in, in uh, Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius bows before uh, uh, Peter, he's got this revelation that God's going to send a messenger, and apparently Cornelius thinks that this is the divine messenger, or that he's God, so he starts to worship him, and, and, and Peter says, no, don't do it. The angels, when, when, when people prosecute them, say, no, don't do it. But when Jesus gets it, he accepts it. So 